You know, it's interesting, I think about this and it's like living a lie. I didn't live uh, a lot of lies, but I lived one big one. You know, it's different, I guess, at this time. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it, it. and what I said in there with just how this story is, is all over the place and there are these two, you know, these just these complete opposite uh, narratives. Um, you know, the only person that can uh, that can actually start to let people understand what what the true narrative is is me. And you should know that better than anybody. Let's get to the the real nature and the real detail of the story. Because we haven't heard it yet. Is the is 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 the truth. Good. Very good. Nervous, but that's good. I'm always nervous for these. Not a lot of room for error. So makes it interesting. Oh uh, yeah. Welcome to the party. In 2009, I set out to make a film about Lance Armstrong's comeback year. It seemed like a great ride. A retired champion with a contentious past comes back to cycling to show them all. Then the Lance doping scandal erupted, and I had to put the film aside. When I picked the film back up, I faced the same question that haunted me in 2009. Why did he come back? He'd won the Tour de France seven times. I wondered what I had been witness to in 2009, and what did it mean now that the truth about Lance was known? In making my new film, all roads seemed to lead back to the past. Good evening. That was a clip from Alex Gibney's documentary, The Armstrong Lie. And we are very fortunate to welcome Mr. Gibney here tonight. As many of you know, Alex Gibney is an Academy Award-winning documentary film producer, director, and writer. His film, Taxi to the Dark Side, won an Oscar for Best Feature-Length Documentary, a Best Director nomination for the Directors Guild of America, as well as a Writers Guild of America Award for Best Screenplay. Alex received another Academy Award nomination in 2006 for Enron, The Smartest Guys in the Room, which also won the Independent Spirit Award and the WGA Award, and he served as an executive producer on the 2007 Academy Award-nominated No End in Sight. Other credits include numerous feature documentaries such as We Steal Secrets, the story of WikiLeaks, as well as Catching Hell, produced for ESPN and nominated for a Sports Emmy for Outstanding Sports Documentary, and Mea Maxima Culpa, Silence in the House of God, which was shortlisted for a 2013 Academy Award and won three primetime 2013 Emmy Awards. Alex's latest film, The Armstrong Lie, had its North American debut at the 2013 Toronto Film Festival and was shortlisted for the 2014 Academy Award. He is currently producing a four-hour documentary about Frank Sinatra for HBO. <laughs> Susan Matamid has been working in documentaries and commercials for over 20 years. She recently completed Girl Adopted, a feature documentary about a teenage Ethiopian girl adopted by an evangelical family in the Ozarks. Before producing and directing Girl Adopted, she worked with Alex at his company Jigsaw Productions for several years, where she produced Enron, the smartest guys in the room, with Gibney, served as the coordinating producer on Alex's and Martin Scorsese's The Blues series for PBS, and co-produced Alex's and Eugene Jarecki's film The Trials of Henry Kissinger. Jenny Amius is an independent producer who has worked on many high-profile television series and feature documentaries. 
Jenny produced No End in Sight and was a producer on the award-winning PBS television series American Masters, as well as now with David Brancaccio. She has also produced episodes of Bloomberg's TV's, Bloomberg TV's excuse me, Innovators and CNBC's Meeting of the Minds. Most recently, she co-produced Alex Gibney's The Armstrong Live. Please join me in welcoming our panel. <laughs> about your relationship and how you work together over the years. <laughs> Susan, over to you. <laughs> anyway, I worked with Alex like That's good. 20 years ago. Um, and then uh, Jenny and I, we worked on the 50s. Yeah. Um, we met in Los Angeles in the early 90s and then uh, worked together in New York on a series uh, about the 1950s. And then a few years later, Jenny and I worked together on a documentary about the Grand Canyon. And, um, and then, Jen, and then I think you went to work for Alex right. um, Kissinger. Um, right. And right. I Before stayed on the Grand Canyon. And then, there's been a little bit of sort of uh, <coughs> intermingling. Overlap. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so describe the different titles in your field for the layman in the audience, myself included. What's the difference between being a producer, an associate producer, a director? What are the different roles? <laughs> you started out By with two definition. very hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can tell it's going downhill fast. Oh, no, don't say that. No, producer is a hard. It, it's a hard. Um, it, it's a hard role to define. It's it's kind of like the the you know, manager on a baseball team. I mean, you you're you're responsible, or or the person who owns the restaurant. It's kind of you're setting the table for everything that goes on. And sometimes it's way more than that. Sometimes it's making huge creative contributions and figuring out the way to get things done. I think that's the best way of thinking about it. For example, you know, I think we'll show a clip a little bit later on, but in Enron, the smartest guys in the room, we, we had precious few resources. I, I, I asked, um, uh, you know, I, I went to Mark Cuban, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks, and said, you know, I'd like to do a documentary about Enron. And, and he said yes immediately, which was great, but I, I'd rather badly under-budgeted the project. That, uh, and so I didn't have a chance to go back and ask for more money. And so Susan uh, was a, a genius at figuring out ways to find um, mechanisms for getting incredible amounts of um, production value on the screen. We shot a, a fiction sequence really in a neighborhood of Los Angeles. In my cousin's garage. I think. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, the. The producer, the associate producer, I mean, it's a pecking order. The producer is at the top, I suppose, but the, um, and, and the associate producer usually has a little bit less experience, but uh, in general, the, the, the producer is the person who makes it all happen. Um, I don't know how else. I think it's different in documentaries than in feature <laughs> films, too. I think in documentaries, it tends to be a little bit less, I mean, everything in documentaries tends to be less, um, less cleanly delineated and demarcated mainly because you just don't have enough uh, resources to pay to have different people doing very distinct different jobs and there's almost no unions involved and um, so like in a feature film I think it's much more uh, discreet but you know we sort of would end up just doing whatever you can do. It can depend. Right. I think an associate producer Certainly in the documentaries that we've worked on, it's usually the one who's dealing with finding, doing a lot of research and finding a lot of the archival footage and dealing with that end of things. And maybe the producer is dealing with the bigger picture and story and setting up the interviews and getting the characters in line. And making sure you don't go over budget. Right, a lot of budget. <laughs> yeah. A lot of budget stuff. Yeah. 
Um, let's jump right in and talk about the Armstrong line. Um, midway through production on your film about Lance Armstrong, you found out that your subject was lying not only to you, but to pretty much the entire world. <laughs> how did you find out about the actual Armstrong lie, and how did you decide to change the film's focus? She was lying? <laughs> <laughs> Um, the film for me started in 2009 when uh, I was hired actually by Sony Pictures uh, and two producers, uh, feature film producers, Frank Marshall, Steven Spielberg's producer, and, and, um, and Matt Tomac, who is now producing the Spider-Man franchise, but was a studio executive at the time. And they had been working on a feature film version, a fiction film version of the Armstrong story. Matt Damon was going to star, it was all good, it was based on Armstrong's biography, it's not about the bike. When he decided to come back, they, uh, they, they abandoned the feature film script, which they didn't like, they couldn't get the script right, but they thought it would be really interesting to do a documentary about his comeback. <laughs> they tapped me, which I initially found thought was a rather odd choice because um, it was to be a kind of inspirational film and generally speaking that's not my make yet. Right. I, I do the opposite of inspirational film. <laughs> my company motto is films that make you sick. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, but nevertheless they, they, they hired me and when I came on board I, I did I, you know, I hadn't fallen off the turnip truck. I figured that Lance had probably doped at some point in the past. But as I went along the way with, with Armstrong, nevertheless, I, I became convinced that this year, 2009, he was clean. Um, and, uh, and so I saw it as a kind of an odd redemption story where you had this athlete trying to prove to himself and everybody that he could win clean, even though he likely, though nobody could say it openly, um, had doped in the past. I mean, it was a, it's very easy now to look at it and think, what, he was lying the whole time. You know, there was a kind of part of what the film was about, it was the conspiracy of silence. There was a lie that everybody was complicit in, in a way. And many people actually were, were true believers, including my two producers. Um, so we went along according to that script, and indeed I finished the film. This was before Jenny came on the project. And we were about to release it, and Matt Damon was the narrator. Um, but then a number of revelations started coming out. Some of his former teammates started to spill the beans. And before you knew it, you had a federal criminal investigation in addition to an investigation by the US Anti-Doping Agency. So, the film, which was finished, <laughs> we felt might be a good idea to <clears throat> not release, just <laughs> hold back on. And, and once it, it seemed like uh, enough, not only enough time had passed, but we knew where the story was going, we went back in. And, and we did, I did receive a call from Armstrong mm, some months prior to Oprah, where he called me up and said, he had lied to me the entire time, and uh, and would I? Uh, but but that he would give me an opportunity to talk to him again, which I felt he owed me. So then the challenge was: we had had a, a very lavish budget to do this inspirational film. We had a much smaller budget <laughs> to do the, the depressing film, the, the film that would make you sick. Um, uh, but I was back in my wheelhouse. So we, we dug back in, we shot a lot of other interviews. I interviewed Lance twice, once immediately after Oprah, which is the, the, the first interview that you see there, uh, and then once a number of months after when his lawyers finally agreed to give me a second interview. And um, Jenny was on board to, to, to help us find very important new archival material about the doping. And so it had to become a completely different kind of a movie, but we had this other movie which we had made. And so the question was, could we make a movie that looked back at the first movie mm -hmm. and figured out, like, what did we see there that we didn't really notice? Our cameras had captured some things, right. but what did we see that we didn't really notice? And so we used that film in a way 
because it was emblematic, it was something that we had, it was emblematic of how he had promulgated the lie, how he had, um, you know, he's a, he's a great liar, and, and he was a great campaigner, and, and it was a kind of um, interesting look at how somebody manufactures a lie like that. So we had to weave all those elements in, and then I had become a, a, a character. I don't know if you want to say anything further. Well, I think in a way it was, it was more your comfort zone, right? Because now you were dealing with sort of an, an abusive power situation. And then, and it was also just interesting to kind of see, you know, who was, who was willing to talk to us and what they were willing to tell us, and also to kind of, to get a little bit of the aspect of the follow the money. We had a great interview with, um, with a journalist from the Wall Street Journal who was also writing a book about it, and he kind of gave us a great perspective of all the different, everybody making all this money off of plants. And so that was just a really interesting perspective to have. So moving along with the idea of taking a story and then having it change before your eyes, Susan, uh, you began working on Girl Adopted with a totally different intent. Um, can you tell us about the project? Um, yeah, I, uh, I set out with this sort of um, naive and just naive notion um, with a friend of mine to make a film that was going to um, take a look at, at kids who are being adopted from Ethiopia um, by American families. And um, we knew somebody, I, I know a woman who adopted an older kid from Ethiopia, it was a time in the, um, in the early, like from 2000 to 2010, where there was, it was part of this whole, the whole <coughs> effort to help kids who were part of the, um, who had been orphaned by AIDS in Africa, and that overlapped with international adoption. There were um, a lot of people adopting older kids from Ethiopia. Um, and so I just thought, well, wow, you're going to take somebody who's never been a parent before and they're going to adopt a kid who's already been in a family and is old enough to understand what that relationship is and that kid is going to go from you know one of the poorest countries in the world to one of the richest countries and they're old enough to understand what that journey is and they're going to have a really different notion of what the exchange is than, the, than what the parents are going to be expecting and wouldn't it be great to sort of follow a few kids and families and see what happens and um, and so we started off and raised some money and started doing that. And it was very, I say naive because we really didn't get, um, we felt like it was just purely observational. Like, let's see what happens. Um, you know, it might go great, it might not go great, who knows. Um, and over the course of working on a film, after a year we filmed like four different kids who went to different parts of the country and it became clear that there was no end in sight. Like, you know, we had a really great beginning to something and no idea where the end, where the story was gonna end up. And, um, and then we um, gradually started to have to figure out how to use our resources and make a film, a different film, um, out of the material that we started with. So we ended up ultimately following one girl who, um, we had the least footage of in the beginning. So it was very painful trying to like throw away all this great footage of all these other kids. But she was the one kid who felt like she really wanted to keep participating in the film over time. And she had sort of a, a narrative arc that we felt like we could you know, hang on to. Um, and, in the end, and so we went on this journey with her over, over years of sort of going, of, going on this real roller coaster and seeing, you know, the whole enterprise sort of crumbling and falling apart and, um, you know, her dreams were sort of dashed and her parents' naive hopes for rescuing her were thrown into question um, and after about, you know, and certainly our dreams were dashed and our naive hopes for being able to make this quick film in a year were thrown into question. But, at the end of about eight years, um, <laughs> we ended up with something that has a beginning, middle, and end, and, and you know, tells the truth of, of that experience. It wasn't at all we set out to do, but we just kind of clung on uh, for dear life. We're going to show a clip from the roll adoption. Smile from 
Bridget. She's a pretty girl, about 13 years old, practicing her English every day. Leave it over. Yes, good for you. Thank you. Thank you.
starting out with kids who were totally, had nobody really to protect them. You know, they were, they didn't understand, we weren't speaking the same language. Um, and I was really aware of the fact that they were probably participating in the film because they were hoping that it was gonna help them get adopted. Um, or something that, you know, I was like this, you know, white lady of means coming in looking like all the adoptive parents with a camera and they weren't really going to say no to me. Um, and then when they came to the States, it, um, it started to feel even more important to, um, for me to be able to recognize why I should be exposing these kids and their families um, in this really sort of um, intimate way. You know, what do they have to gain um, from participating in the film? So I think that was just something I wrestled with a lot over the course of making that film. I was sort of always trying to feel like, um, like in some way, I wasn't just like bulldozing over them with my agenda and that I was being um, true in some way to what their, uh, that, that there was something in it for them, mm -hmm. you know, beyond just trying to make me happy so that, you know, I'll do some unspecified, good, helpful thing for them. I don't know. And I'm Alex, totally kidding myself. Oops. <laughs> Does that, um, how, how do you approach your subjects? Is the idea of a, what they are getting out of it part of what you bring to an interview or your research or? Uh, <laughs> I'm different. No, I, I mean, I, I was going to make a quip about it, but I, rather than do that, I mean, I, I think that I think that even though I make films that are sometimes investigative and, um, and explore issues which may, you know, not always paint people in the best light, I think my job is to not only persuade people that, um, I will, that they can trust me with their testimony, uh, but that I will be a fair broker, that I will listen to what they have to say fairly and present it. Um, it's in a way that, that doesn't try to uh, distort what it is that they have to say. So I will be an honest um, interlocutor in, in that sense. And, and I, I approach everybody now with that in mind, that even in the editing room when things change, because if people do lie to me, I mean, it's, and Armstrong being a classic example, but he certainly wasn't the first one, and I doubt he'll be the last. Um, but nevertheless, and so in the cutting room, um, you know, you have the opportunity to arrange um, the images in such a way as to express the way that you feel about the situation and, and, and what happened. And sometimes that makes people look bad, but I take it as a point of pride that when um, I cut something in or when I present something in a certain way, however that is, I have to imagine myself going, if, if it makes somebody look bad, I have to imagine myself going to that person, showing it to them, and saying, this is what I think represents the truth and I feel it's fair. So that I don't feel, you know, because you're, you're making something very public. And, and unless you can do that, it seems like you, you can't put it in. Um, and I think that, uh, I just thought of an example about Enron uh, that I thought Susan would remember, but now I've forgotten. Um, uh, but but I, think, I think that's the acid test. So in that sense, um, I reckon that, you know, very often I go to people and I have to make an argument to them as to why they should participate. You know, Armstrong would be a classic case. I think there was a reason why I should participate, but a, a more risky um, choice of participation had to do with, a, a, you know, Elliot Spitzer, for example. I made a film about him. And I had to go and make an argument to him as to why, when he hadn't spoken to anybody else, if he spoke to me, why that would be of interest, why, in his interest to do it. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, it's, it's an argument that, that has to be made. So, so you have to reckon with this issue when you do it. At the same time, I also feel that ultimately, 
my final and ultimate obligation is owed to you all, that is to say, the, the viewer, because at the end of the day, my final obligation is to them. And, and sometimes it's a tricky balance with some interview subjects in particular, uh, where I'm going to them, and of course I'm encouraging them to talk and encouraging them to trust me, but at the end of the day, too, I also have to communicate in some kind of subtle way that at the end of the day, I'm not there, I'm not there to be their pal or to be their advocate necessarily. I'm there to try to present something as truthfully as I can. And so how, how do you do that? How, how do you keep your subjects involved this to all of you when, and participating in the interview even when it's tough? And how do you, how do you keep them invested? I mean, for myself, there's two ways. One is that I often go to people, often through other people, to try to convince them that they should trust me, that I'm an honest broker. But sometimes I have to make an argument about why something might be in their self-interest. I, I, for example, I never was able to get him on film, but, for, but I, I visited him in prison a number of times. Uh, the famous corrupt lobbyist Jack Abramoff, and I made a film about him called Casino Jack, in the United States of Money. And, um, I managed to go see him in prison a number of times, and I said to him finally, I said, look, uh, he, was, um, he was very conservative, and he had a tradition in the past of talking to people who were either Jewish or conservative or preferably both. And I said, I'm neither, so why should you talk to me? And I said, I'll give you one reason, which is that a lot of people see you as a bad apple. I think that this is more a case of the rotten barrel, and I bet that's a message that you'd like to convey. And he liked that idea. Um, so that was, a, that was a mechanism by which I could be honest with him, but at the same time give him a reason as to why he might move forward. He did agree to be interviewed, but ultimately um, the Department of Justice prevented us from interviewing him. But anyway, that gives you an idea of, of how to go in and talk to somebody. So, you know, we wanted to interview Floyd Lanson. I think Floyd wanted to participate with us, but ultimately he was involved in a lawsuit that was through the Department of Justice and he couldn't. So, you know, a lot of times you get kind of stymied by these bigger situations that are unavoidable. But I think, you know, we would have been obviously very fair with him and it would have been great to get his perspective. So sometimes it doesn't work out, which is, you know, frustrating. The law, it turns out, is not always a great mechanism to <laughs> <laughs> convey the truth. Yes. Right. And Susan, you can talk about going into um, uh, being in, in such a private, intimate setting, as you said, with the family from Girl Adopted. Yeah, I saw um, this movie uh, this winter, um, Philomena. I don't know if anyone saw that movie. And I felt like, um, oh, wow, he really caught that um, that sort of conundrum that you're in when you you know you convince somebody that they're gonna that you're going to help them tell their story and then they get cold feet and how do you um, you know how do you keep them uh, on the hook and interested and invested um, when things start to change because a lot of times like for instance in this film the parents um, were really really private people. And they had no interest in being in a documentary film whatsoever. However, they did feel like they were about to do something very meaningful and profound in rescuing a child as they saw it at the time. And I think in the beginning they felt like they were going to be part of some sort of like PSA or maybe they were going to participate in this film and it was going to motivate other people to come forward and do the same thing. Well, six months later, we were filming in their house and their daughter, you know, told them that she hated them and she wanted to run away and she didn't want to have anything to do with them. And then it became, you know, a challenging series of conversations in which the whole premise of why they were participating in the film had to be really looked at and we had to, you know, talk about um, why it would be in their interest to to stay on. And with them, I mean, every single shoot was like that. It was like pulling teeth because they really were not people. And that's what I kind of liked about them. Because there were other people who came forward and were like, hey, I want to be in a documentary. And I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But yeah, so there are times when it all changes and you have to just be um, constantly uh, trying to reframe and you know keep everybody on the boat. I'm going to show one more clip from Girl Adopted. Oh, I'll give you just a little background okay. to this clip. This is about um, two years later when um, Winchat goes, things are a little better, she's happier with her family, and they take her back to Ethiopia to visit. She's very excited to go back for the first time. She's <coughs> taking her adopted father and her sisters um, to see the orphanage. Which I thought was amazing that her father was with the father. They were super supportive. sequence really in a neighborhood of Los Angeles. My cousin's garage. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, the, the producer, the associate producer, I mean, it's a pecking order. The producer is at the top, I suppose, but the, um, and the associate producer usually has a little bit less experience, but uh, in general, the, the, the producer is the person who makes it all happen. Um, I don't know how else I think it's different in documentaries than in feature films, too. I think in documentaries it tends to be a little bit less, I mean, everything in documentaries tends to be less um, less cleanly delineated and demarcated, mainly because we just don't have enough uh, resources to pay to have different people doing very distinct different jobs, and there's almost no unions involved. And, um, so, like in a feature film, I think it's much more uh, just but you know, you sort of would end up just doing whatever you can do. It can depend. Right. I think an associate producer, certainly the documentaries that we've worked on, it's usually the one who's dealing with finding, doing a lot of research and finding a lot of the archival footage and dealing with that end of things. And maybe the producer is dealing with the bigger picture and the story and setting up the interviews and getting the characters in line. And making sure you don't go over budget. Right. <laughs> a lot of budget. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of budget stuff. Yeah. 
I also think if you have, I think maybe if you're dealing with politicians, like we were on a no end in sight, then you have people who have their own agenda and they're bringing that to the table. And then you kind of have to sort through what they're saying and present present the, the truth in a different way, not necessarily the way that they might present it. So, you know, it's, it's a very different kind of thing when you're dealing with somebody who's, where it's their own personal story versus somebody who's, you know, a politician who's got a much bigger agenda, or, you know, less personal agenda. Uh, word, exactly. No, no, and, and I face the, the uh, I face that problem in a in a more institutional way in Taxi to the Dark Side. When we went to Guantanamo, and when we went to Guantanamo, this is 2006. Um, you know, they would take members of the press around and give you a tour, and it was very much of a kind of Potemkin village tour. And I think, and, and, and judging from other films that I had seen that had been shot down, that everybody was desperately trying to show how it really was. And it was almost impossible because of the way they gave the tour. So we made the decision that actually, what we would do is we would, instead of pointing our cameras out, we pointed our cameras more in. And we showed them giving us the tour. And in a way that was far more instructive and far more revealing, which was the phony tour ended up being more revealing than uh, it might have been if we had ignored their attempts to try to influence us. Because uh, you, they simply wouldn't allow you to shoot anything except for the fact that, yes, there's a McDonald's, yes, there's a subway, yes, there's a movie theater, and, and yes, look, there's ping pong tables where the detainees can play. It's all good. <laughs> uh, I'd like to switch gears and show the arm shot. When everyone cheats, then it becomes hugely distorted. It becomes a different contest, a contest of who's got the best doctor, who's got the most money, who's got the biggest risk tolerance. And the guy who was that guy for this era was Lance. That's where it becomes a game of power. When you can say, I'm signing up Ferrari to be my exclusive doctor. When you can say, I'm going to use a private jet to travel around, to evade detection. Life, for me at the time, was moving fast. Look at 2005, I was I had won seven tours in a row, I was engaged to a beautiful rock star, I was... But that all just felt normal to me. I certainly was very confident that I would never be caught. So, um, on the topic of power, uh, Alex, you said of um, Julian Assange, the subject of your film, We Steal Secrets, the story of WikiLeaks, that at some point Julian goes astray, and at some point he decides that because what he's doing is so good and so important, that it's okay if he starts to shape the truth or behave a bit reprehensibly. <coughs> this theme reverberates through a lot of your work. Um, we touched on it a little bit, but could you talk a little more about what's the attraction to stories of power and the abuse of power? Well, I seem, <laughs> I seem to be drawn to those stories, so I, I don't know what I can say about that, except that I am. But I, I do think that the, the process that you mentioned is something that I've become increasingly interested in. And there is a guy, one of Assange's associates, who taught me a phrase which I learned that police departments use a lot. It's called noble cause corruption. And noble cause corruption is basically the idea of somebody who becomes so convinced of their own goodness that it's okay if they bend the rules because after all, the end justifies the means. And so in a police force, that's often the guy who's, who's trying to get somebody for extortion, can't get them for extortion, but they know they're a bad guy, so they plan a joint on them, and then they bust them for possession of, of marijuana. And, and that, but over time, that spins out of control. Even in the case of Enron, as Susan and I noticed, you know, one of the most interesting sequences that, you know, in the film is is these audio tapes of the Enron electricity traders in California. As oh, they, we have them. As, as, well, we'll see them in a bit. Too much of that. <laughs> anyway, they and, and and they're gleeful as they bring down the California grid. Yeah. But what's interesting about it is that in talking about it, either and very often we couldn't persuade them to come on camera. We got a few to do so. They would they would talk about what they were doing as very much 
as a part of a mission. That they had a mission, which was a kind of radical free market agenda mission. And the idea was that you've got to thin the herd. And there's got to be some pain for some gain. And, that, and so they saw shutting down the California grid as a way of showing all those stupid people in California that um, there was a better way to do electricity. And the only way to get that message across was to use the market to punish everybody. Um, you know, it seems, particularly in practice, it's utterly abhorrent. But the process starts small. And, and over time, that noble cause corruption spins out. And I think Lance Armstrong is a classic example. He came to believe that because you know he was helping so many cancer survivors, that the magnitude of his lie was actually an important thing. He was helping people. Um, so it's that that process of self-deception that I find very interesting because there are very few people who commit crimes or are fraudulent or uh, abuse power because they think this is going to be fun. I'm going to fuck some people up. It's very unusual. Most often it happens because they're, they have a rationalization. Well, somebody once said, economic man is not rational. He's a rationalizer. And, and so people have rationalizations about why their behavior is so good and valuable, and that takes them down corruption. And I find that very interesting, because you can't understand how to prevent crimes unless you understand how Work, so. mm. I, mean, I just want to allow the whole system to support um, the corruption and the hiding and the lying and all of that also because because it's much easier to get a lot of people complicit in your crime when when they can get on board with your you know higher value notion I guess. Yeah, I mean in the case of Enron it's hard again, it's like it's hard to remember when Lance was on top of the world, you know, before Enron fell, um, Jeff Skilling, Ken Lay, and Andy Fastow from New Providence High here, um, <laughs> who was the CFO, were touted as the best executives in the country. And Enron was, was touted as the best corporation, the one we should all emulate. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting how that works. And people are willing to forgive a lot uh, if you're famous or if you're powerful. I'm going to show that, and I had it for the end, but since we were talking about it, let's show it now, the um, piece we were just talking about. In the early 60s, Stanley Milgram tried to figure out what characteristics there were of evil people. Was there an evil strain, or could normal people do really bad things? And so he set up this experiment. In the experiment, he had an actor playing an experimental subject and a real experimental subject. Well, the they went into this room, and he had an experimenter say, we're going to see if mild electric shocks will help people memorize lists. Uh, incorrect. So now I get a shock of 75 volts. Soft air. He kind of did some yelling. The Milgram experiment has a lot to say about Enron, because I think people lost their sense of morality. Like Milgram, once you accepted the idea that behaving inhumanely was okay, you could do anything, and the shocks increased with the number of mistakes that they made. I can't stand it. I'm not going to kill a man. The subject, the real subject, is begging the scientist-looking person to stop, too, and the scientist only says, the experiment requires that you continue. Please continue. Go on. You accept the little responsibility? <laughs> responsibility. In a way, Skilling was almost like the guy telling those people below him that it was okay to up the power. Go on at 20 volts. California's electric utilities may have to pull the plug on millions of customers. The fucking cooler thing is that a lot of my head. Holy fuck, yeah. You gotta love the way I'm Go on at 35 volts. During the height of Wednesday's blackout, fire crews had to free people trapped in elevators. We must continue. Go on, please. You're going to keep giving them, what, 450 volts that we got now? That's correct. Continue. It's kind of hard to say, well, we should be, you know, we shouldn't do this even though it's allowed because 
you know, I mean, that's what we do, right? And the thing that happened is fucking an earthquake, but the thing flowed up to the Pacific and it fucking candles. Boys, 450 volts. Milgram's discovery was disturbing. 50% of the subjects were willing to shock to the death so long as the commands came from a seemingly legitimate source. Another major theme in your work is <coughs> uh, Lightning in a Bottle, The Eagles, the Blues television series, and upcoming works on Sinatra and Fela. What draws you to this subject? What, what, the, what, who wouldn't like music? <laughs> <laughs> As a subject. <laughs> you know, I, 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 mean, I love music, so I'm lucky enough to make documentaries about it. It draws me to it. I mean, it's, it's as simple as that. In some of the other films that I do that are not necessarily related to music, um, you know, tended to use music a lot. Sometimes it's a kind of sometimes it's a kind of toe tapping recourse, and sometimes, you know, as a, as a mood setter. Um, but um, you know, music is such is a universal language, and so it's uh, it's powerful. I don't know if I can explain it any more than that. I think it's used very well. I think in. Um in Lance, he used it really well because there's this one, you know, one in, in the lead up to the Tour de France, he goes and does lots of other tours, and he does one in California, and it's just pouring down with rain, and you have this really kind of sad Tom Waits song, Long Way Home, and they're all kind of just like cycling in the rain, and it's just like pouring down on them, and there's this great song that's so evocative, and you just, uh, you know, it kind of just puts you in that kind of rainy place. And that's fun to do. I mean, that uh, I had the, the good fortune of working with a the German filmmaker Wim Wenders when we yeah. did the Blue series, and he is a big fan of just, you know, cutting together images with fantastic music. And in, in that instance, there's no narration, there's no analysis, there's just shots of uh, a lot of men cycling in the rain uh, with, a, with a very, very powerful song uh, over it. And, I, and it's, um, it, you know, if you, I suppose you could say, well, there's no utility to this scene, but actually, you know, I, I think it's quite powerful. It tells you a lot, but in ways that you can't quite express. And it seems to me that when you make documentaries, that that's one of the reasons for doing it, is that otherwise you could just do a PowerPoint presentation. If you have <laughs> images <Never> and... <laughs> you know, if you have images and, and, and sound that... that can't be explained by how you might write it down on a piece of paper. It just has to be experienced because it's on the screen. Um, I'd like to talk about structure. Um, moving from, you, you mentioned before uh, the editing process, uh, uh, moving from the concept through to the finish. How do you ideally structure your films? <laughs> What's your, do you start with a script? Do you start with a shape? Do you prefer to let the editor shape the material? Is it different every film? How do we start with Enron? You know what's funny about Enron? <laughs> I'll tell you. <ya. laughs> um, Please do. <laughs> you wrote a treatment mm -hmm. to give to Mark Cuban, mm -hmm. right? That one was called Black Magic. Mm -hmm. And it was like a page and a half long or something. Right. Then we got the money, we thought we were making the movie that was like the book, we couldn't get anybody who was on the book, in the book, to appear in the movie. We went through a dark time of saying like, oh, we could do um, shadow puppets, or... <laughs> <laughs> shadow puppets is always the back <laughs> That was my idea. <laughs> Ultimately, you know, we were able to pull the film together, but later I read that treatment again and I was like, holy cow, like we never looked at that treatment again, but really it that end film was very similar to the treatment. So something in here <laughs> was um because you know because Alice is a really strong writer, so he and he comes in 
at the end and does a big writing pass of the narration and works with the editor to do that sort of final pass. And so I think it's that same voice and the same, you know, original seed of the germ of the idea. Yes, the seed of magic. But I, I think that I, I do think that story structure is important. And sometimes I will think of story structure in advance, even though you have to be willing to. Um, you have to be willing to follow the material, and the California sequence is a good example. In the book, we, you know, there was a book before there was a movie. It was called *The Smartest Guys in the Room*, written by <coughs> Peter Elkind and, and, and Bethany McLean. There was very, very little about California in the book, but we found this incredible material, which we found during the making of the film as we were desperately trying to get people to talk to us. Uh, these audio tapes of the Enron traders, and it was fantastic. And so we made room for that in the film, but. I, I think maybe that what was, you know, I think for the kind of, um, you know, call them political or, or abuse of power movies, I think maybe abuse of power I'm more comfortable with. Um, you know, I always think that you should have a structure so that people who either don't share your point of view or aren't that interested in politics can follow the story because it's a good story. and. You know, I always saw Enron as a kind of a heist movie. Uh, how do you pull off the heist? And then how did they get caught? Uh, I saw Taxi to the Dark Side as a kind of murder mystery. You know, who killed Dilawar? Dilawar was the taxi, the young Afghan taxi cab driver. Um, you know, and, and I think that, um, you know, and, and uh, We Steal Secrets was kind of an international thriller. So. That, I think, is, is helpful in terms of structuring the material. So you start out with an idea, or I start out with an idea, but then go through and, and certainly willing to divert. In the case of We Steal Secrets, I started out to make a very simple film, a, a, a David and Goliath story, all about Julian Assange. And I ended up, along the way, because Assange wouldn't talk to me, <laughs> um, making half the film about young Bradley, now Chelsea Manning. Mm -hmm. who turned out to be a very, very compelling and sympathetic character. And I never would have thought going in that I would have spent any time on that character. So it has to change, but it, I think it's useful to have a point of view going in so long as you're both, uh, you impose some discipline, but you're willing to be flexible. Otherwise, you're not making a documentary like Susan's experience or, 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 or my experience on um, the Armstrong film. I mean, <laughs> it would have been a disaster if I had been rigid about that. It also helps to have an editor who sits in there with the hundreds of hours of footage yes. to <laughs> dump on them. He goes like, ah! Um, and that's the other thing. I mean, you, you, Susan raises an extremely important point, which is that, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, <laughs> Susan will laugh when I say this, but I'm, I'm not the person who sits with the editor and says, please cut here. <laughs> Just the opposite. Um, the editor you know, will go in and create sequences, and I, I will respond. But I also find it very useful to give material to an editor and let them respond to it. Because when you're in the field and you shoot stuff, you not only see what the camera's getting, but you see what's here, what's there. There's a kind of affect in terms of the room. It may be very tense. That may or may not be reflected in what you actually get in terms of footage. And the editors are usually ruthless about that. So like you may have thought that sequence was good, but actually it was boring. <laughs> um, and and it's, a, it's a very important part of the process to let them see the material cold. And they respond to it sometimes in a very different way than you do. Yes, screams, like in the Milgram experiment, often come out of the edit room. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you one scream I, on, on Enron. I asked Alison Elwood, the genius editor who oh, put that film together, if she would uh, do a sequence on mark-to-market -mark accounting. <laughs> I've never seen an editor weep so quickly. <laughs> yeah, she did a good job. Screaming.